Hello everybody and welcome to this afternoon's webinar. We're going to be dipping into 3D GIS and taking you on a tour through uh, some of the capabilities of the ArcGIS platform. For this afternoon's session, we've got three uh, speakers. So uh, I'm the warm-up act, so I'm Alistair Hind. I work uh, at Esri UK and I'm the technical pre-sales lead on 3D GIS. And then we've got uh, Mick Dunn from Nottingham City Council sharing their experiences and showing us a fantastic uh, 3D application that they've put together to help them in the, the planning sphere. And then finishing the trio is Elliot Hartley from Garsdale Design, and he's going to be talking about uh, primarily about City Engine. So uh, let's get cracking. In this first section, I'm going to give a short tour of some of the ways in which you can use 3D within ArcGIS. But before we start moving into that, we're actually going to start with a, a 2D map. And I want to use this just to think a little bit about why we would use 3D uh, in GIS. What does it provide us that enriches our experience or our products uh, for our customers by making that switch into 3D? And it's the same principles as we apply to working in 2D. So GIS allows us to understand the spatial relationships between things. And working in 3D can enhance that understanding and provide new insights and, and new analysis capabilities. But GIS is also about uh, creating maps and creating maps to present data and information to an end user group. And that's where I want to start, is just by thinking about how 3D can enhance that communication aspect of the work that we do. So I'm going to bring in uh, a layer from the Living Atlas and I'm going to use the RSPB bird reserve layer and we'll add that into our map and then just so we can see the areas uh, represented a little bit more we're going to zoom in on focusing on uh, the Orkney Islands and in particular on the large reserve on Hoy so if we change the symbology slightly, we can see the extent of the reserve and we can also see some underlying information uh, about that part of Hoy. So by stepping in, uh, we shift over to uh, some OS um, mapping. So this is the, the very familiar 1 to 50k uh, maps. This is a, a map style that quite a lot of the members of the public are familiar with. And it does provide information both about the, the kind of the features such as roads and, and the land extent, but also obviously uh, provides information about the topography of the area. So the contours indicate that the north end of Hoy is, is actually quite hilly. And for somebody like myself, and I suspect a lot of the people listening to the webinar, those contours, we can understand them both from a kind of systematic point of view, but also we're familiar enough with looking at contours to be able to interpret them mentally and form our own picture of what that landscape looks like. But we have to think about whether that's true of our end users. And even if they are able to do it, is it an extra kind of bit of work that we're putting them through to uh, get the information across that we really want to provide? So if our aim is actually just to give people a sense of what that area of Hoy is like and give them a sense of what they'll encounter if they visit the bird reserve, we can make use of 3D. So here we've moved over into a web scene and if we now return to focusing on that particular area, we can see the terrain in Hoy. We're using the imagery to, to kind of give that real world experience as well. And so people get a very immediate sense of what that landscape's like and the dominance of uh, Ward Hill in the centre here with the, the glens running either side of it. So it gives people a much more immediate experience of, of what the, the terrain is like. And if we're working with web scenes, one of the other things that we can do to help our audience is to make use of the slides. So on the right hand side here, we can choose a view, a key view, and uh, capture a slide. We'll call this one Ward Hill South. And we can then use these slides to allow people to move easily around the view. So we can focus in on the cliffs on the uh, northwest side of Hoy and 
as well as moving around the site that we're interested in, we can also use it to take people on a journey across a, a series of sites. So there is a number of reserves in Hoi, so we can give people the opportunity to, to move through that landscape in a guided, controlled manner. So slides can be a very useful navigational uh, option. So that's really just to give you an idea of how taking some 2D data and using the capabilities that are in ArcGIS you can present them in a different way for your audience and give them a stronger sense of the, the landscape that you're focused in on. We're now going to step into ArcGIS Pro and here we're looking at some data for deer counts in Scotland and these have been ag aggregated and the spatial pattern is presented using a simple colour scale for the, the values uh, with red being high, yellow, low. But again, still working with 2D data, we can make use of the 3D capabilities to create a different kind of view of that data. So if we make our layer a 3D layer and use the extrusion option here, we're extruding based on uh, the count values, we can then create something that has a quite a different look to it and provide our users with a different view that may for them be easier to connect with and easier to understand those uh, numeric differences across the uh, area. And it also provides a different kind of uh, impact to the maps that we're creating as well. So that's another way in which, again, still working with 2D data, we can uh, make use of those uh, 3D capabilities. Now we're going to have a look at starting to work with uh, 3D data itself and we're going to move to an urban setting. So this is Perth in Scotland. But I'm going to start the journey again with my 2D data. Uh, so I've got OS master map uh, footprints here. And I'm, for this I'm going to use the building uh, height data that OS are gradually building up for the country. So this provides us with a minimum and a maximum height for the building. And we're going to make use of those to take our 2D data and create a, a 3D, a simple 3D model of Perth. So again, I move my layer up into uh, the 3D layers and I choose to extrude the layer. And here I'm extruding it based on the uh, rel h max value so I'm going to extrude my blocks to the maximum height. So we've now got a, a simple representation of the built environment within Perth and you'll see that the uh, again the, the terrain is represented uh, down the bottom here under the elevation surfaces we've got ground and at the bottom we've got our default uh, elevation ser service which is the hosted service in ArcGIS Online and this gives us a good general sense of the landscape but we might also have our own more accurate higher resolution terrain data and we can bring that in in Pro and enhance the the terrain locally so I've added that as a um, source, as an elevation source. And if we uh, just focus on this area here, on the railway line and the area to the left, when I activate that terrain layer, it will redraw the scene uh, and it's rebuilding the, the local cache that it uses. And you'll see that there's much greater definition of the, the landscape and the particular the railway cutting here. But we still get that distant view, we still get the hills in the background. So it allows us to use local data and uh, then default back to that hosted service uh, for the kind of broader extent. So now that we've got a simple representation of our um, urban environment, we'll look at a very simple uh, scenario for how we might make use of that. So we're going to move over to a view looking across the river to the um, historic center of Perth. And uh, one of the ways in which we might make use of uh, a scene like this would be to understand the, the visual relationship between elements in the built environment. So if we imagine that we've got a, a planning proposal for building on the east side of Perth, and it's got quite a significant elevation uh, to one side of it. 
And it's easy to imagine that that would have uh, an effect on what's visible from uh, this uh, amenity area here. But we can make use of the tools in ArcGIS to look at that in a more systematic way. And there are tools within the geoprocessing toolset within 3D Analyst that will allow you to create uh, systematic view sheds. But they've also uh, recently added some interactive analysis tools. So with these we get the option to create a simple line of sight. Um, we can also create a view dome if we're interested in what's visible from a location uh, in a th kind of 360 view. But the one I want to focus on here is the view shed tool. So we're going to push out the distance a little bit and we'll use the interactive orientation option. So from the top of the hill here I can now create a view shed looking across towards the city centre view back over the river to the old town and we can see the impact that this proposed building would have. So you'll see this block here that's an area where the, the view's being blocked and by switching elements on and off within our view we can explore that. We can also shift the view and um, so if we want to adjust where we're looking uh, we can shift that view and it gives us the option to provide uh, a fixed location so again it's something that you can have a, a key location that you want to create a view from and make use of that. So that's quite a simple uh, sense of how you might use this in a planning uh, scenario and that's something that the next two speakers will come back to as they uh, talk about the work that they've been doing. So in terms of the, the built-in representation of the built environment that I have here, we've got a simple representation of our initial proposal was using a multi-patch which is the three-dimensional object in ArcGIS but we might also have more detailed uh, models available. So we can load in uh, data from things like SketchUp uh, and other building models but also uh, one of the recent bits of functionality was the ability to load Revit files directly. So this is part of the uh, ongoing work between Esri and Autodesk as part of their strategic partnership to make it easier to work with data from the two systems and use them in the complementary world of the, the other company's system. So here we've loaded in a Revit file and this is reading directly from the Revit file so there's no conversion of the data and it allows us to take a relatively detailed building model and look at it within its geographic context and understand how it would fit within that wider landscape. And we can also represent landscape changes themselves. So make, again making use of the option to provide alternative uh, terrains. You'll see at the moment this building is gradually disappearing into the hillside but in the actual development there would be some re-landscaping so we can bring that in and see how that um, uh, sits within the, the view as well. And then uh, that Revit file as well as being able to view it within the desktop environment is also something that we can publish out to a web scene and I'll come back to that in a minute. But before we leave Pro, one of the other things that I just wanted to touch on briefly was the options for working with multi-patches. So at the moment these uh, buildings are a simple extrusion so it's a visual representation that's three-dimensional. They're not true three-dimensional objects yet. So the next thing that we would do uh, would be to use 3D Analyst to convert these to multi-patch features. And uh, just before we do I'd like to draw your attention to this uh, large building that dominates the centre of Perth. This is actually uh, a church. Uh, if we look from the top you can get a sense of uh, the shape and it's got the um, the uh, kind of architectural, um, sorry, the, um, oh, I've forgotten what they're called so I'll cut that. And at the moment using a simple extrusion that's clearly a misrepresentation of the shape of the building. So one of the things that we can do by converting it to a multi-patch feature is to actually start to make changes and start to make adjustments to those uh, what are now three-dimensional objects. So here I've pushed the elevation of the main body of the church back down to a more realistic height and giving us a simple representation of the tower. 
So we have another church here and I was just going to use this to illustrate how that works. So if I go into the editing options and I choose the uh, to modify the vertices and select my feature and you'll see I've already split off the tower end of the church as a separate face and I'll show you how that's done in a second and this then gives me handles on both faces which I can use to adjust the height of that whole element. So I can push down the body of the church and then this church actually has a pitched roof so the next thing I'm going to do is to split the church body surface so um, there's a simple tool that allows you to divide the surfaces of the multi-patch up and so that you can start to edit the individual elements which is how I split out the tower at the beginning and then I can now drag up the handle for the intervening boundary and it will create me a pitched roof so in a relatively uh, easy process we can start to make some adjustments to our simple block models to create something that's more re representative. There are other ways of, uh, of achieving that same thing as well. There's a few different options and there's also the option to bring in models from other packages as well. So I mentioned that we were going to finish by looking at sharing this up into a web environment. So if we go back into ArcGIS Online, this is uh, the set of building blocks for Perth published up into a scene. And this time I've chosen to symbolize them based on attribution within the multi-patch. So a multi-patch can, uh, like any other GIS object, can hold attribution and we can use that as part of symbolizing that layer. So here uh, it's a simple representation of some key buildings. So we've got the station, the hospital and also some uh, education buildings. So using the site theme we've picked those out in a different colour just to help people reference key elements within the landscape. And then the last thing that we're going to look at before I hand on to Mick is to look at that Revit file again. So I mentioned that having brought a Revit model into ArcGIS Pro you can then share that up into a web scene and this is a great way of opening up data that can be difficult for people to access and make it much more readily accessible but also still looking at it within that wider geographic context. So you'll notice uh, on the right here those of you that are familiar with the scene viewer uh, options that because I've got a Revit model which I've packaged as a building layer included in my scene I have access to this building explorer and this lets me view that building and its structure in a similar way to the way it's structured within the Revit model. So we have these themes of architectural, structural and electrical. And we can choose what elements within the model we want to be able to see at any one time. Lastly, one of the other features that you might have noticed in this particular web scene is that we have shadowing on. So this is something that you can choose to make use of within the scene. So it's been a very brief tour. One of the things that I'm aware that I haven't had a chance to talk about uh, is uh, point clouds. But hopefully it's given you a sense of some of the ways that you can start to use 3D within the GIS. And I'm now going to hand on to Mick. Good afternoon, as it says on the tin. I'm Mick Dunn. I manage uh, geographical information services here at Nottingham City Council. Um, I've been asked today to demonstrate what we have achieved with 3D at Nottingham particularly uh, how we have deployed the Esri 3D Online uh, capabilities. Uh, before I get down to showing you one of the, our applications, maybe two of time permitting, I thought I'd describe a little bit about our 3D journey, which leads on to our business objectives and, and the uh, team's future aspirations in this area, and then I'll do a live demo. So, um, I've established so much in a traditional 2D GIS environment, we have been, we've had a kind of a long-standing aspiration to create an intelligent 3D city model here at Nottingham based upon what we've achieved in a 2D environment. Um, we're not new to 3D modeling. We've been working in this area um, with 3D digital modeling for about 10 years, but in a limited capacity, uh, particularly associated with occasional design and visual illustrations. Um, 
there has previously been little or no integration of the corporate GIS processes. Um, there has been an early aspiration to link the two areas of work, but the processing power and the technology links weren't felt to be strong enough. And the quality of the outputs at the time didn't really meet um, the demands and expectations of our planning uh, department. I think these things have changed over more recent years. Uh, I'm sure we all see that there's been significant advances in technology, particularly processing power, associated 3D software, and the availability and affordability of 3D data. Uh, we also see uh, utilization and awareness of digital 3D modeling has generally increased. Um, you know, the advent of online design software, whether it's your kitchen or your garden, or gaming software, etc. I guess in a way not too dissimilar to how 3D mapping has now become commonplace. Um, things started to change at the council. Um, demand for 3D modeling started to changed significantly about two years ago in order to support, when we were looking to support our urban design team. They started to use it to assess large-scale city centre developments. And what they wanted to do is evaluate um, planning schemes as they, as they proceed through the planning process. The main function of the model was to assess key viewing corridors and vistas to inform permitted development consultations with developers. Um, similar to kind of the functionality that Alistair was just showing in our pro. Um, the business use has now expanded and progressed uh, to the point where developers of major development schemes are now encouraged and requested to submit 3D building proposals so that we can incorporate them into our 3D digital city model. And when I say 3D city model, it's a detailed model and I'll show you a, a little snapshot of that in a minute. Um, the reason for this is to support the reason why we're doing this is to support the planning pre-application discussion process prior to the planning applications being submitted. Um, this, this approach has been running now for about a year and a half um, has been, and has been welcomed by developers and city planners and it has led to quicker and more efficient and effective planning process. Um, because it is now part of a key business process, awareness and interest of the potential capabilities has also increased within the organisation because our, you know, more of our staff are aware of it, our senior managers and, uh, uh, and our, our councillors. This increased demand from the business, however, has presented a number of challenges, particularly when we're dealing with a detailed uh, kind of architectural 3D model because that model is stuck on a single PC and accessible and controllable by really a single individual. So that's an example of what I'm talking about. That's a snapshot of what our architectural 3D environment looks like. So very fine detailed buildings across the city centre. So that land, you know, that, that, that increased business use, that land locking of the, the tool, the kind of reliance on that individual led to a number of business op business objectives from our planners. Basically, that was to improve the portability of the 3D modeling capabilities so that it could support the pre-application process better, um, to unlock some of the functionality that is available, to, particularly in terms of visualizations and assessments, uh, putting that, hand, that, in, that in the hands of our planners and urban designers. Um, looking to align our GIS data management processes with the 3D modeling processes and to give consideration to business continuity. Now that it's tied into a business process, we can't have it on one, one PC and one individual. Our team aspirations are build apps, um, basically to develop robust, user-friendly apps that look great and perform equally as well, both for the public and internally. Um, but it's important to have efficient integrated workflow processes. Um, we need to really need to establish integrated workflow processes between our 3D design software, which is mainly SketchUp. Uh, we're giving, giving consideration to possibly including BIM software, but it must align with our GIS, uh, corporate GIS processes. And using Able, we've got to kind of align it with those processes as well. 
So it's essential to our efficient and effective data management processes in all of this. The example I'm going to show you in a minute is around uh, promoting development sites. But our aspiration, another one of our aspirations or goals is to kind of use this technology to support engagement and collaboration uh, activities of the council. So that, that would be associated with not just physical things, but social aspects of the city as well. Um, and last but not least, we don't want uh, just a visualization tool. We want a rich, intelligent city model. That's what our aspiration is. So the first thing I'm going to show you is, um, well, our re most recent development has been to create a mobile solution to promote city regeneration activities. Um, and basically to stimulate further interest and highlight opportunities to investors and developers into the city. At the moment, the, our clients for this pocket application are some of our senior directors and council leader who are all involved in city developments. Uh, so the application was commissioned basically to support their discussions at uh, MIPIN next week, which is basically an international property event which they are occurring to promote the city and its opportunities. Um, the site I'm about to demonstrate utilizes Esri JavaScript API. We've utilized the version 4 of the API to enhance and modify one of Esri's default templates. Um, you know that you get a range of templates with, with, with this package. Um, the template was a good starting point, but it didn't fully support the requirements of the business. So we've, I'm lucky to have uh, technical developers in my team, so they've worked hard to adjust that. Uh, the base maps 3D model are all held at Able for all performance reasons for this particular application. So, what does it look like? So here we have a 3D map of key regeneration developments currently occurring across the south side of Nottingham City Centre. Um, green symbology denoting development stage of a particular site, so dark green indicating that work has started on that site, uh, vibrant green that work is about to commence soon, and pale green are those sites where there's early discussions and it's before the planning approval has been granted. Um, as you'd expect with any online mapping application, it includes all the usual navigation functionality such as uh, panning around, zooming in, um, which you can do with a mouse or if you've got a touchscreen device, which those uh, clients I mentioned earlier will all have when they're having those discussions. You can operate it with your fingers or we've got the standard controls that you'll find in the Esri templates, which allow you to zoom in, uh, rotate, go back home, and I suppose specifically for uh, 3D, adjust the tilt. Um, so besides that, what else does it do? We've built it so that you can change um, and add various layers. So if I click on this, I won't because of performance issues on my laptop at the moment. It will um, bring up aerial photography, so basically change this stylized base map. Or if I click on here, it will change using the attribute information associated with these buildings, how they're classified. So now it's showing those developments by use class, where Orange is denoting uh, office development, red is residential, and this yellow color is uh, mixed use. Um, hopefully when I was zooming in and out there, you'll notice that, um, that the, there's some variation in the level of detail of the 3D buildings. There are a number of reasons for this. Basically, there's a mixture there basically to en enhance um, navigation so people can navigate around, so they are familiar with particular areas of the city, um, to put things into context, um, but also, not least really, performance. Given this app is to be used on a mobile device during a conversation, performance for this particular application has been a major consideration, and in some respects, a major constraint. Uh, the biggest consideration in respect of the level of detail in the data. So the, the more detailed data, you're going to get a performance hit essentially. So we've basically designed a 3D building layer that blends high, 
high detailed architectural level buildings. So you can see uh, the city station being one of those. And our tram bridge. And I'll show you some other examples. And those at Nenoscum, this is the Market Square and the Council Building. So you can see there's quite a lot of detail on there. So that's come from that detailed uh, 3D model that I showed earlier. For our development sites, what we've done is created massing blocks, so simplifying the uh, architectural design. And for the rest of it, we've basically um, use master map polygons. So the architectural buildings from BIM or similar software are extremely detailed uh, and can include design elements of buildings that are not needed or desirable in this type of application and cause a major performance issue. Um, I mean these models can, would include the rooms, the stairs, even down to doorknobs. So lots of uh, data as you can probably imagine. Um, so this is one of the reasons why we chose to represent uh, principally iconic buildings, as we describe them, in this manner. In terms of master map, creating a 3D world from master map and building heights is a less complex and significantly faster process, but not without its problems too. Just using master map polygons and building heights would not have supported our business need in this case because we needed something that was highly visual. Traditional 2D, as we found at the moment, doesn't translate to an acceptable 3D world. Uh, there's quite a bit of uh, adjustment, if you, depending on your, your business need, obviously, but when you're talking about developments and people want the detail, it's, it's not going to work. So the last thing I just wanted to show you on this is it isn't just a visualization tool, it is an information tool. So if you click on a particular site, it will bring up information pertinent to that site. So, so each of those sites contains key information, so it tells you uh, when it's, when it's uh, commencing, what it is, developer, size, etc. So we can add um, as much attribute information as we choose. Or we can provide links. So here we've linked to our planning system. So uh, if, if it has passed the planning uh, process, basically it will link through to our planning system and there you can go and get the full planning history and documents, etc. So it, it provides a, a link. Um, given the audience today, I've introduced this application as a from a mapping professional's perspective, but that's not how, in, how it's intended to work or how we expect our uh, senior colleagues to use it. We intend them to use it through this kind of uh, storybook idea. So the storybook basically, so uh, the intention is as they're having a conversation they can choose the category of site they're interested in. So if they want to discuss sites where there's immediate development happening or something that's happening soon, they can quickly go to them. So you know, sub, sub classifications here in terms of those green categories that I showed earlier. Uh, and we've seen that as they have a conversation about this particular development, they can now see it in context in this 3D environment, which they love. Um, and what it allows them to do is also, whilst they're talking to us about particularly this site, they can then click on the map and it will then bring up information to that other site. So it allows information to be discussed in context and visualized, and you've got a lot of information associated with it. Um, that's all I wanted to kind of talk about on that particular application. I know I'm short of time. Um, I just wanted to show you one other application that is a prototype, just to show you um, one in more detail with a little bit more functionality. Um, this is for internal purposes only and it, at the moment, is still in prototype. Our energy has been focused on that pocket app for our managers. So very similar, similar approach in terms of a customized template. So similar type, in, same information in some regards. 
Um, same functionality, but richer functionality. So this little application allows you to choose what layers of information you want to see. The reason I wanted to open it up was a couple of things. One is to show you the level of detail, uh, more so in relation to those master map polygons. So I'll first I'll close it now. But if you remember the first one, let me open it so you can see. It was very, very simplified. Um, so here, if we kind of have a bit of focus around the station area, you can see there's a lot of levels to the, the data and different heights. If we go into the next app, basically we've simplified it as far as we can go without kind of losing uh, the 3D appeal. And that's mainly because of the performance aspects. You can see that the level of detail here is much simpler than the level of detail in this, in this kind of approach. Um, we've been developing this to show additional functionality so that you can add labels. Um, and a nifty thing that I like is being able to bring in those proposals and allowing the user to actually switch them on and off as they choose. And we've tried to enrich it with additional information by having also these information points, so these um, orange pins. And if you click on one of those, you're either going to get a video of about a particular site or you can get a URL link. And what this links to is that uh, a video of that detailed city model that I was describing. So that's all I wanted to show you on that. Um, just to highlight perhaps a few key considerations if you're getting involved in this, it's one is be pretty, pretty, you know, pretty sure about what your business use is, um, which goes without saying, but sometimes we kind of get carried away with things. Um, a big thing when we were developing the, uh, this application was thinking about the devices. So there's you know, a plethora of devices, devices now available, and it will look, it will look, perform, very, very differently depending on the device that's used. Uh, performance is essential for us. I mean, it's great these things look good. But if they don't perform, they're just, it's just not going to go anywhere. So that's why a lot of effort went into processing that data and making sure that we could display the best 3D information that we could, but making sure that it performed really well. Uh, getting the right level of detail is, I think, essential if you want to sell this stuff. Uh, and don't forget about your data management processes. Uh, thank you for listening. That's all from me. I'll hand over to the next presenter. My name is Elliot Hartley, and I'm Managing Director of Garsdale Design, a professional 3D geodesign consultancy based here in the Yorkshire Dales National Park and Cumbria. National Park in and this Cumbria. section of the webinar, I give a brief overview of what City Engine is and where it's being used, and then give you a simple demo walkthrough using City Engine and ArcGIS Pro. I will conclude this demo with a brief overview of what to expect in the upcoming 2019 release of City Engine. Primarily, City Engine is a 3D procedural modelling application. 3D geometries are created with lines of code rather than a typical 3D modelling application workflows such as SketchUp, which require a click and drag approach. It's a versatile, standalone 3D modelling application for urban environments. And it's being used in a surprising range of industries. Urban planning, city and local government, architecture, geospatial, real estate, entertainment and the military. Today's demo is a simple workflow from ArcGIS Pro to City Engine and back again, uh, plus some export options. In a lot of our projects, uh, workflows are modified depending on the task at hand. What's on screen now is a typical workflow where we're using AutoCAD, ArcGIS Pro, as well as other GIS products, and City Engine to produce a range of products from the printed page to things like game environments and uh, online GIS environments. Today's demo is a simple workflow from ArcGIS Pro to City Engine and back again, uh, plus some export options.
We've used ArcGIS Pro here to set up a range of bookmarks both in 2D and 3D, preparing us for the outputs later on. And now we'll load up City Engine and we've imported here from the file geo database that we created in ArcGIS Pro the data sets and organized neatly into layers on the left here. And you can see the planning areas um, and I've used a rule to describe them as the purple similar to the symbology we have in ArcGIS Pro. And then I've brought in the existing 3D buildings of Birmingham and you can see now that looks nice and we've used the get map data tool to bring in some base map data either satellite imagery or something from ArcGIS Online's base map selection I've also created a rule to assess the complexity of models based on the Graphic Complexity Index, um, a white paper created by Chris Andrews at Esri Inc. Over here is a good example. Some models are more complex than others. So here's a tree and we can see that has um, four polygons associated with it. 20 Fenchurch Street or the Walkie Talkie building has 39 polygons. The Swiss Ray building here has 72 and the Leadenhall skyscraper well that has 116 vertices. This diagrammatic tree 160 a nice detailed tree model. This has 1651 polygons and this person or giant 265 polygons and finally the GD3D taxi London Black Cab uh, well that has quite a few polygons associated with it um, 1941 sometimes it's good to use a rule like this to understand the complexity of the models you're putting in often imported SketchUp models will have more geometries than your traditional captured um, geospatial data Moving on, we'll switch off the GCI display and go and select one of the planning areas to create a zoning volume that can be used by planners to limit heights of buildings. And it's a fairly visual rule I've used here to drag up a volume, but also give out a sort of a, 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 a ceiling that you can place and overlap onto surrounding buildings. And you can see we can bring it up to a point where we think well the surrounding buildings we don't want it too high this new development so we'll bring it up to here and then we'll turn off some of the display elements so we have a nice just a, a visualization of the site's um, zoning height and we can do the same on other sites as well these rule files are not included as part of City Engine, they're things I've created myself. Back to the site now and look at the site again with a new rule file and here it starts with a default generation of a little bit of a park area but we turn on using the handles uh, a switch and we turn on the analysis and this is uh, dynamic reporting into the dashboard here so every geometry can be reported back on and multiplied or or divided by particular metrics that you want to measure in this case we're just doing simple land use green being residential and we're just playing around with the building orientation as well as site orientation and then we're going to dynamically adjust some of the setbacks raise the height now let's check it against the height planning volume that we had and we can look at see how many residential how much residential space there is the floor area the total floor area for those buildings it's only those levels highlighted in green at the moment um, and now we're adding some more levels of land use this is commercial office and residential 
and we can go in and use the local edits tool to switch off blocks, turn them into parks, and have a look at the dashboard again. Turn on a visual style, this could be something that's designed um, or geotypical of the area or a particular uh, design that you have in mind. All the while we're still having that underlying reporting happen, a visualization for the web scene or maybe to put into something like Unreal or maybe even print. Lastly in the city engine model we'll quickly add a Hyperloop transit network into the centre of Birmingham. This rule file will be made available at the end of the webinar. Did you know City Engine has some ViewShed creation tools that you can use to dynamically view the impact of your proposal or scenario on a particular urban area? Here you can see we're looking at the views out from this apartment block, but equally we can turn it around and see whether this development can be seen by a particular site or from a particular vantage point. And bear in mind all the geometry is being reported back into the dashboard as well. Whilst you're doing this view shed creation, you can also get a feedback on the land use that's within each of those building plots as a metric for further analysis. City Engine allows you to export to a wide range of formats from the geospatial to the 3D modelling environments. Here we've exported out our 3D procedural models into a file geodatabase for further usage in ArcGIS Pro, either as an analysis basis or just for producing paper maps and PDFs as part of a report. We can also export to a scene layer package from City Engine for use on ArcGIS Online in web scenes. We can export City Engine to a physical model, a 3D printable model. Um, this I tend to use a combination of SketchUp and Cura from Ultimaker. And there's been great strides in export functionality to Unreal Studio. Here, very quickly, we can export out that 3D, same 3D model we had in a web scene and a 3D print, as well as ArcGIS Pro. But in this case, we're putting it in Unreal Studio, ready for virtual reality or game type environments. The immediate future for City Engine is a 2019.0 release in the first half of this year. I expect there to be further integration work with Unreal Studio because it's just so successful um, with smoother export and import functionality via Unreal Datasmith. The recent announcement of ArcGIS Urban suggests an interesting path for City Engine with deeper integration with ArcGIS Online and in particular ArcGIS Urban. And then I'm seeing a wider move for the use of procedural technology um, for a variety of solutions, for example in the property technology sector. We have a client called Faster Property who are integrating some of the procedural technologies into their workflows. Thank you very much for watching. I hope it's been of interest to you today. Uh, if, should you require any of the links or resources associated with this part of the webinar, please visit garsdaledesign.co.uk. Thank you to um, both Elliot and also to Mick for their presentations. And so uh, in terms of uh, what next, hopefully we've inspired you and interested you in the possibilities of uh, 3D GIS. Uh, so first and foremost, please tell us uh, what you thought of the webinar and also what other things you would like to hear more about within this particular area. So there'll be a follow-up email come out to you with a questionnaire and also that link to the, the recording and uh, so you can share the webinar or uh, watch it again uh, at your leisure. Please keep an eye out on our blogs, Geo Exchange and Think Location. 3D GIS is something that's really taking off and that will help you uh, keep up with uh, those changes. One of the things that Mick and Elliot both talked about was the, that kind of process of preparing the, the data, the content that you would use in your 3D GIS. And again, this is something that uh, we're happy to help you with. So please get in touch if you're interested in pursuing that. 
and we've got a, a particular offering uh, targeted at local governments. Uh, so if you're interested in any of that, please please do reach out to us and get in touch. And also we run a number of training courses uh, related to 3D. Uh, so there's a, an ArcGIS Pro course, uh, which is looking at working with the 3D analyst extension. Uh, there's also one, as I say, point cloud data is something we weren't able to cover within this session but we do have a course focused uh, just on working with lidar data and also a city engine for professionals course if you're interested in any of those courses there's a discount code uh, related to this webinar uh, so you can get 10 percent off the courses if you book by the end of april uh, using the code on the screen uh, which we'll also share with you in the follow-up so we're a little bit tight for time, but we've got time for a couple of questions. Uh, so one of the questions that's come in for uh, Mick is around keeping the model up to date. And I think there was also a question about the uh, cartography that he'd used within the 3D map and whether or not there was a, a legend to help users uh, understand that. So um, if you're able to jump in, Mick, and cover those, that would be fantastic. Hi there. Um... I, I didn't. Sh there is a legend in the application. I just didn't get around to showing you. But in in the app, there there is because the uh, application is using the Esri template. The usual controls about um, accessing uh, various layers and turning on base maps. There's an element in there that allows you to see the legend. And also in the um, the kind of storybook pane. The last pane, which I didn't get to show you, was the legend of the, for the data that is currently showing. So it's dynamic. Does that make sense? Does that? Yeah, no, that's great, Mick. And I guess one of the other things uh, that I was wondering about was whether, whether your approach to choosing the cartography and choosing the symbology when you were working with 3D, whether you saw any changes in the way you were approaching that to how you would maybe have approached it uh, in a kind of more traditional uh, 2D map. Um, in this instance, the colouring of the uh, of the of the development status isn't something that was in my control. Um, it was something that was kind of set up, and we had to run with. Personally, we wouldn't have used green as a colour uh, for for you know, sort of reasons, and we wouldn't usually use a, a graduated colour in this instance. Sometimes. Sometimes these choices are made for, is they? Yeah, you do have to be careful about colouring though, because uh, what, one of the things we did find in that particular app was when we were using transparencies, uh, the transparencies would blend with shadowing and created kind of unusual colouring. Um, so that was new to us. Yeah, we're we're on a very steep learning curve with this. I must admit, it's, you know, whilst we have been, like, say, using 3D in, in kind of architectural design. In the three in the GIS environment, this is fairly new to us. Um, but you know, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's drawing on the same skills and experiences. We just need to, um, yeah, top up our knowledge and experience. The biggest thing in the in the um, presentation was about the need to make sure that your, your data uh, detail is correct and balancing that with performance, which I think Alec Elliot's kind of touched on in this presentation too. Okay, thank you, Mick. Um, we've got a question about Unreal and uh, the exporter for City Engine, um, and somebody's asking about uh, whether Unreal is likely to be bundled with City Engine or not. Um, I don't know if if Elliot's heard anything else on the grapevine, uh, grapevine but my my expectation would be that they would uh, sit as as kind of separate applications, but with that ability to connect to them. Yeah, I, I, I can add to that. I, though I, I doubt very much there'll be a, a, a sort of a bundling of Unreal with City Engine. There's a lot of export and import functionality between the two, so there's no need for that, really. I think some people are asking whether there'll be better rendering within City Engine itself, and I can see there's potential for improvement on there, but Unreal is really a separate install and always will be. Just quickly following on from what Mick was saying about symbology and the problems there, I, I would advise that you, you don't throw away your cartographic principles, but you do, are mindful of transparencies and shadows. So often what I would do is take the shadows off of my 3D web scenes and, and be very careful with transparencies. 
Okay, thank you for those uh, thoughts, Elia. Um, so, a uh, couple of other questions coming in. Um, so, one of them, uh, which I'll pass to Mick in a second, is around um, using 3D uh, for rural areas as well as for urban. And just before I um, let Mick um, sort of answer uh, for the, the Nottingham area, we've got um, a couple of other customers who are actively um, looking at using um, 3D GIS in a, in, a, in a sorry in a rural setting. Um, so uh, one example was around um, that ability to understand developments in a wider geographic context. So where you've got a, a, a rural setting, you know some of the the kind of key views uh, you'd be looking at impact um, of a development across a a, a, a a longer distance. So being able to look at that within something like GIS that can represent those. Uh, distances can be quite beneficial um, and uh, Elliot's just reminded me in the, the chat window that um, uh, he's also been looking at um, using uh, 3D within the, the Sebra area where, where he's actually based and um, so Mick is, is that something that you've have you ex kind of extended out beyond the, the, the kind of city boundaries uh, in your own experiences yet or has it been primarily focused on that city centre development scenario? No, um, mainly it's a completely different ball game. I would have thought in some respects, but no, mainly in the city centre. But you, you've got to imagine Nottingham is a city that's kind of just a, we don't really have any rural elements. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I can't imagine that's kind of um, well. I'm yet to kind of experience here and stuff. Yeah, we just don't. We're not going to have that area where we've got you know acres and hectares of open space we just don't have it in the city yeah so we are we're okay. more about looking at the detail for us yeah okay thank you mick um so we'll need to wrap up in a minute but um just a last question to uh elliot uh, around um just a i guess a brief uh, explanation on some of the uses of uh, that he's seeing for 3d within real estate and property de property development yeah so the, in in terms of real estate and property, it really does depend on the the, the company, the organisation you are. But often, if you're managing a large amount of properties within an urban area, being able to visualise where they are and do analysis on, say, which apartments have the best views is is particularly useful. Um, but also identification of sites. Um, we we've seen that in the Nottingham City example, where actually being able to see in context proposals as well as properties really helps people focus their minds on on potential areas of investment or, or opportunity so it's it's pretty useful okay, okay. thank you and um, uh, we'll need to wrap up now um, but uh, as I said before please do uh, keep an eye out for um, for information on our blogs, but also on the social media channels as well. And there are some um, exciting uh, developments on the way. 3D has been a, a kind of a key development area for the ArcGIS platform over the last couple of years. And myself, Mick and, and Elliot will have, uh, have experienced the change in terms of the capability. Um, but also, as uh, Elliot mentioned, there's uh, some big new developments coming. So ArcGIS Urban and ArcGIS and Indoors. So do please keep an eye out for those. And uh, so just finish by uh, thanking uh, both Mick and uh, Elliot again for their time and for sharing their experiences. And also thank you for uh, listening in. I hope you found it a useful webinar.